the thing about all these different theories is that they're coming from people who are trying to solve the aging problem. And that's the first hint, is that we're categorizing aging as a problem. Welcome to the Food Matters Podcast, your home for health and wellness. My name is James Colhoun, filmmaker and founder of foodmatters.com, and I am your host on this journey to inner and outer transformation. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a short moment to talk to you about the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, because studying nutrition completely changed my life. It helped me to heal my father, get him off six different medications, lose 50 pounds, and completely regain and transform his life and health. But the problem is, is that we're not really taught about nutrition in our schooling system. The medical profession is rarely pronouncing the facts of using nutrition as medicine. And we have a fast food industry that thrives off misleading consumers. So if you're looking to learn about how to use nutrition as medicine to either heal yourself or a loved one or help prevent chronic disease, or you want to take that next step on your study and nutrition journey and become a certified nutrition coach, then the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program is for you. This is a 10-week or self-paced internationally accredited certification program designed to take you through some of the most important topics on the la and the latest research when it comes to nutrition and natural healing, including gut healing, autoimmune conditions, balancing hormones naturally, detoxification, biochemical individual approaches to nutrition, plus it brings together the best that we know about uh, nutrition science and anthropological research and bringing these two approaches together to help you cut through the confusion about what to eat and what to avoid for optimum health. To find out more about the nutrition certification program, plus to download your curriculum guide, head to foodmatters.com forward slash study. You can pause this right now. It will only take you 30 seconds. That's foodmatters.com forward slash study, or you can head to the show notes for more information. Have a beautiful day. Hey everyone, it's James here from Food Matters and today I got a special guest with me. We're going to be talking about longevity. We're not only going to be talking about how to age, let's say gracefully, but what does it mean to live a long healthy life? What's more important, longevity or quality of life? Some of these philosophical questions we're going to go deep on. My guest is a health educator, practitioner, author, speaker. He's got a new book called Beyond Longevity. Um, his name is Jason Prahl. Uh, the book's coming out with Hay House, one of my favorite publishers. And in 2018, Jason traveled to 10 countries to create the Human Longevity Project, which is a documentary film series, which basically uncovers the true nature of chronic degenerative disease in our modern world. And he's really, you know, focused his interest in ancient sort of knowledge and understanding sort of modern philosophy and bringing those two together. And so we're going to have a bit of a chat today on all of these topics and help you understand how you can age like a beautiful, graceful, amazing person. Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, James. Good to see you. Awesome. So let's start at the beginning. As Buckminster Fuller says, start at the beginning. That quote is so funny. David Wolf told, told me that one day. Um, <laughs> let's start there. What got you interested in this? Like what, what got you onto this sort of health longevity sort of bent, should I say? Well, I mean, I think like most people who are interested in health, um, it's their own health, right? Like it's it's the things that we, we suffer from that that tend to um, kind of focus our attention into an area, right? And for me, it was it was all things physical health. So I had chronic knee pain uh, at 13 years old that was never really figured out or addressed by the by the traditional medical system. I had um, I had skin issues, some something called seborrheic dermatitis on my face that was all over my face um, in my 20s, and that's it's kind of like a dandruff, but it's so it's oily, scaly. I, I remember actually I played college football and I I took off my helmet and of course I'm sweaty and I I could literally scrape off like three, four, five skin layers, like kind of like wet newspaper on glass, right? Like I literally just scraped it off and like chucked it on the ground. So, you know, these are some pretty significant things. And, and it actually kind of gets into maybe something we can talk about too when it comes to health, but somewhat traumatic things, right? In other words, they disrupted social aspects to who I was. And when it comes to the, the doctor stuff, I actually developed a little bit of a combative relationship with the medical system, right? And I think most of us can probably identify that if we've suffered from some chronic ailments, there's a frustration that they can't help me, right? And every time I go in, and so it's the system that just doesn't seem to work. And so that's really what got me 
into the health field. Um, you know, I was a mechanical engineer for 10 years, uh, thought I wanted to do that for, for life. I was in a pretty good position, you know, 10 years in, as an engineer is like, that's like the sweet spot. Like you're young enough to where you're like really attractive as a partner in a, in a firm. And you're, you've been in the industry just long enough to actually know something. Right. So, so it's like a really valuable place. And I walked away kind of right at that, like right as I was peaking. And so, um, walked into this sort of functional medicine, uh, health coach sort of role that I didn't know anything about, you know, I, I knew a lot about health. I studied a lot. I took some courses and trainings and that kind of thing, but I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't know how to go get clients. And ultimately I didn't really know how to work with people one-on-one, -on -one, right? So it's not something that you can learn to do without, without doing it. And so that's really what propelled me um, into the space working with a lot of people that had chronic ailments, you know, um, cancers, autoimmune conditions. As I got good at what I was doing, I, I tended to see the more difficult cases. So I would help somebody with a complex thing. They would refer, you know, a friend or two that had seen a number of naturopaths and functional medicine people and, you know, all the kinds of, of practitioners that are out there and they would end up on my doorstep. Right. And so that was interesting because I felt confident in what I was doing and I was kind of using a functional medicine model, you know, doing lab testing, a functional lab testing. And, um, and then it stopped working because I, I got these really complex cases and I couldn't resolve them. I couldn't get them. I can get them. Some people I get, I could help them get better, but I couldn't get them over the hump. I couldn't resolve the thing that they were really struggling with. And so that led me in, it opened up a new world of, of trauma. Right. And then I realized, oh man, this is this thing that we call trauma. And that's a very loose sort of term that's another big piece. So then I had to dive into what the heck all this is. And it, it started with my own stuff, which of course I'm still working on, like, like most of us that, that, do, that do inner work seems to never, never end. So, um, so that's really kind of what, what prompted me along this sort of health journey. Nice. Really interesting. And one of the things I resonate with you really deeply on that you talked about just then was this frustration that the mainstream medical profession are unable to deal with certain chronic cases. Um, my father's case, you know, severe chronic fatigue syndrome was bedridden for many years on a cocktail of different medications. They just couldn't offer him any hope. They're like, yep. look, we can just try some meds, but we'll, we'll see, see how it goes. And I feel like a large percentage of people that are facing challenges with modern or conventional healthcare are in that that bucket and they're they're frustrated and we see a lot of them in our community i'm sure in your community as well and and that leads has led you and i to turn towards these sort of natural alternatives when what was it that got you interested in longevity because this is a big topic for so many people um and it's it's the cornerstone of our conversation today uh, but what was it that got you particularly interested in that and then into the documentary and now of course the the book that you're working on well it's it's actually kind of paradoxical because what got me into that was actually I really didn't care about longevity um it wasn't a thing i only framed it that way it was actually a sort of marketing position that i that i chose because i was interested in all the things that led to good health right so it was like okay there's all these things that I was teaching. I was teaching chronobiology or circadian rhythm and how that affects our biology. I was teaching, you know, nutrition and how to individualize that for each for each person. I was teaching, of course, exercise and what that looks like because that's different for every person depending on their goal, their age, their whatever they're doing, right? I was teaching, um, you know, anything and everything related to health. Um, relationships and how those impact things, right? And, and infections and detox. And so there's this wide array of things that I was wanting to, well, that I was working with my clients on and that I wanted to share with the world and teach. And so I, I thought, how can I sort of frame this thing? I can't just call it the everything plan, right? Like, so, so it was really in, in sort of this longevity box, this longevity equation that I, that I wanted to frame this sort of education. And, and so I thought, what a better way, um, well, let me back up. The other part of it was that, that I actually was interested in longevity to, to a degree. In, in one context I was, which was that there seemed to be certain people that live a long time. And right now in our Western world, we're actually declining in our sort of life expectancy. And so what's going on there and how can we how can we dig into that deeper in a way to teach health principles, right? So that, that's really what I was interested in about. And, and so that led to the Human Longevity Project film series. And, and we kind of piggybacked on the blue zones work and, and I'll, I'll detail what the blue zones are, but we, we wanted to go further than the blue zones went than the work that they did. Cause they did really great work and, and actually met with a demographer, uh, Michelle Poulon, who was the first person 
to sort of outline a blue zone, which is, which is a region in the world that can be statistically identified that you have people reaching 100 years of age and it's documentable um, high, at a higher rate than, than other parts of the world, right? So it's kind of these statistical parameters that were scientifically set, right? But the tricky part with that, and speaking with Michelle, is that he had to be able to verify the, the birth certificates, right? And if you go back 100 years in most of the remote parts of the world where he's finding these blue zones, it was difficult, right? There's not a lot of great record keeping 100 years ago. And so that, and then the, po the places that do have good record keeping don't seem to be any sort of anomaly, right? So it's really interesting sort of paradox that he found himself in. And going forward, this is actually my argument that I'm not sure we're gonna see a blue zone, a new blue zone ever again. Like that's what's weird. And, and there's a few reasons and I'll get into that maybe, but, but, but he identified along with National Geographic, these sort of regions around the world that met his statistical parameters uh, for reaching uh, 100 years of age at a higher rate than, than other parts of the world. And so that's interesting in and of itself, right? And so that led their discussion or their discovery, their inquisition. What is that? Why is it happening in these places? What can we learn? And that's a great place to start. Like, what can we learn from these people? Um, but just like any other uh, investigation, it really comes down to the questions. How good are the questions you're asking? And, and where's your starting point when it comes to health knowledge? Right. So, um, and I think they did a pretty good job, but I think they, they missed a couple key aspects that we can talk about. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to those blue zones. I wanted to speak with people that are in their nineties and 100 and beyond. I want to ask them about their life in a way to, as a, as sort of a, um, a Trojan horse for my own message for health uh, and vitality, because I, I, I felt that they were probably going to echo the things that, that I was teaching, but I wanted it to come from them and there's unique wisdoms that they share too. And so um, that was what was cool. And, and plus I just like to travel. And um, so, you know, I wanted to go to these cool places like Icaria, Greece and Sardinia, Italy and oh, Okinawa yeah, yeah. And, and Costa Rica. Yeah. And so that's what we did. And we had a lot of fun doing it. Nice. So cool. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I've been really, um, in a way secretly obsessed with these little pockets of longevity and let's say yeah. happiness and quality of life, because totally. I think that from a nutritional perspective, and I'm sure you're aware of this, a lot of the data gets caught up in these like big meta-analysis studies and, and research studies of, 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 of sometimes indigenous people, but very often these homogenous developed countries sort of group of, of subjects. And then we develop these, these new reasonings and, and ideas about what modern nutrition science should be and then the food pyramid and everything. And it's like, wait, we have people already thriving on planet Earth right now. And this is where I sort of talk about this love as a crossover between modern science and anthropology coming together. And the anthropological data is awesome because it's a living science, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's real, it's there. And, and I want to sort of frame the conversation here because let's think about for the, for the people listening to this podcast, for the community listening to this, they're thinking, okay, so I want longevity, but what is it that we want? And I feel like Andrew Saul said something to me interestingly when I interviewed him for Food Matters a long time ago. And he said, look, with someone with a chronic degenerative disease, like say cancer, for instance, and they're about to go down, say, two different paths. One is like a cut, poison, burn approach. And, you know, we, we know statistically, typically with specific types of cancers, very with a lot of data, exactly what happens to us, the percentage of people that go down that path. X percent go this long, X percent go this long. But the quality of life is generally quite low. And then we've got this sort of more natural path, which is like, okay, say if someone's given three months to live and they, they've got this cut, poison, burn approach, or if they're like, look, we can do intravenous vitamin C, detox therapy, this, and then you can go and just cruise on a, a, a cruise around the world, maybe to go to see Ikaria or try to increase quality of life as much as possible. When he framed that issue, I was like, wow, I'd go for the quality of life over this like really difficult, tough, like cut, poison, burn approach. And then it made me think, well, isn't that a macro idea for life? Quality trumps length. And then, but length and quality is the double win, right? So 
what is it that we really want when we think about longevity and for people in their 30s and 40s that it's not super on the radar but people in 50s and 60s and then i've got friends that just hit 70 um it's like damn you know you're, you start to knock on it and you got friends that are dropping um what what is the focus here what's really the most important element of longevity from your perspective in your research yeah, I, I love this. And this is one of the reasons I really did want to go speak with people in their 80s, 90s, 100s, because they can provide a perspective on life, on longevity, on how important diet is versus extra. They actually lived it, right? So so they mm. can actually give me feedback, right? And one of the things that, that, that I, I always felt like a fraud talking about longevity because I'm only 42, right? So honestly, what do I know about longevity? It doesn't come from my, my experience, right? And that's the only true wisdom can come from your own experience. Everything else is secondhand or thirdhand knowledge or observation and you putting puzzle pieces together, right? Which may or may not be successful. So, um, so that was really important for me to, to hear it directly from the horse's mouth, what was going on. Now, granted, we only spoke with maybe 25 or 30 people in those sort of older ranges, but the nice part was, was they're from around the world, different cultures, different perspectives, and, and you start to see patterns, right? And one of the things that we never heard from somebody in their 70s, 80s, 90s, 100 beyond, is that they cared about how long they were gonna live. Not a single one of them cared how much longer they had to live. Now, sure, they, they wanted to live, you know, and certain people, they, in fact, they, they engaged with life um, to the point where it was obvious they, 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 they had a gratitude for each day. But isn't that the point, right? Like, isn't that the point that you have gratitude for today, that you're able to live today fully? I mean, to me, this is my edge. My edge isn't like, how long am I gonna live? My edge is like, can I live today to the best of my ability? Can I actually be present throughout my day? And right now the answer is no. I haven't been successful at being totally present every moment throughout my day with gratitude and joy. Like, and granted, that stuff can can ebb and flow, right? But can I can I can I live from a point of well-being every moment of every day? That to me is the objective. And so if I can do that, then we, I should I think longevity starts to getting interesting because now it's like how many moments of well-being can I experience in my life? That's maybe a better mark, right? Because if I live 150 years, 200 years, and I'm miserable, I'm resentful, and I'm bitter, and I'm destroying the planet, and I have poor relationships, I mean, what's the point, right? So like, it, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And I think the other reason I, I wanted to sort of frame this longevity discussion in my docuseries and in, in my new book is we're at a really interesting period in, in history where we have regenerative medicine. So even to your point, I agree, quality of life is critical. But even beyond that, we have... So it's quality of life internally, but but also how am I affecting the, the planet, my society, my family, my my local community? Because regenerative medicine is is here and it's gonna be it's gonna be even more powerful, more impressive, more amazing in the next 10, 15, 20 years. But if I'm living out of alignment, right? In other words, by living out of alignment in a variety of ways, I'm creating disharmony in the body, and then I just go to turn to regenerative medicine to save me, and I'm constantly dipping into the well of regenerative medicine. That to me doesn't sound like a, even though I'm sort of, I'm, I'm throwing quality of life away, but then I'm gaining it back. And you know what I mean? I'm just on this endless cycle of trying to recover my health. That doesn't seem like a very good solution either, right? So we're actually at a very important like nexus when it comes to the philosophy of life, the philosophy of aging, because we're gonna, we're already doing pretty, let's say questionable things, but definitely interesting things um, with life, you know, and, and there's babies now, there's designer babies. We're actually taking, uh, you know, a sperm, an egg from a mother, and then we're taking mitochondria from a third mother, and we're combining that into like a, a baby with two moms, and a dad. like it's really, really weird and interesting. And so, you know, this is where I think we need to raise awareness around what we're here for, what is life all about, what's important, and, and what does it look like, not only for my own happiness, sense of well-being, but how am I impacting the world? How am I impacting mm. particularly my family, local community, and, and outward, right? Like that's where it starts to become really important. Absolutely. I think what, you, what you're touching on there, Jason, is, is really hit an interesting chord, especially around the gratitude and forgiveness, which is probably the opposite of resentment, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people speak to this um, in the Transcendence docuseries. We cover this a lot in, re in relation to chronic disease, in particular cancer, and how like there's typically a cancer trigger, which is one of the top three killers in the world, right? And it's, it's typically like something dramatic or traumatic, should I say, that happens in life. And you mentioned trauma at the start of this, this conversation. 
But if I reflect on, on an anecdotal piece of information, if I may, in my life, so Laurentine, um, my partner and the co-founder of Food Matters, she, her grandmother, Oma Hetty, lived at home by herself unassisted to 102 years of age and then went wow. into a home. Uh, she had someone come two or three days a week just to help wash up for like two or three hours a day or bring some groceries. Then she went into a home and, and passed away at 103. And up until she died, she was like super aware, like super, con- like exa- knew exactly what was happening in each of our lives and would, would comment on that. Like she was sharp and, um, you know, she started to lose some some of her eyesight towards the end there, which is the only reason she had to like start to leave her home. And she was she was a bit bummed about that. She's like, damn it, you know, I want to stay here. So, and her diet was not perfect and I was big into nutrition at the time. So, I'm questioning this going, damn, what's what's going on here? But I obviously was getting a lot of data inputs from other sides of non-nutrition work and I was reading a lot of longevity books like Healthy at 100 by John Robbins and this Blue Zone research. And then I noticed what she would do. She'd wake up in the morning and she'd go pick some fresh herbs from the garden and make a tea. But then in the afternoon, she'd fill that teapot back up and put some alcohol in there. I'm like, wait, what? And then she'd be eating some bread. I'm like, no, no, no. But then in the morning, she would sit there and put on like some Gregorian chants or some beautiful like church music. Mm -hmm. And she'd just sit there and do some prayers and just be, she was so grateful for life. She's so grateful. She'd be like, oh, is this neat geweldig, she'd say in Dutch. Isn't this beautiful? (laughs) Everything, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this wonderful? Every moment. It was like she was tripping on some mind-altering substance just in terms of gratitude. And I'm like, damn, what a powerful attitude to embody for long longevity and health and happiness. Tell me, how big a part of longevity is this sort of gratitude? Because you did touch on it. And, and was that a common thread between all the people that you interviewed from these sort of long-lived, healthy, happy people? Yeah, I, I love that story. Um, and those are the anecdotes, honestly, that, that to me are the most inspiring. Like mm. when I hear or see or, or engage with somebody that that is living that way, that is what inspires me. And to me, there's so many lessons from from those people. And your, your question's a good one. And to be honest, I mean, I, I wanna be totally honest about longevity and where what we think we know. We don't know anything. I mean, we really don't. I, I, I know people think that, there's research out there and all this, but the truth is a human life is so long, how you cannot study it, right? Let alone a population and try to weed out wh- what's important and which one, which factored into what, right? Like, as you mentioned, like there's so many people that are in their 90s, 100s and they smoke and they drink and they they do all these things that we know are unhealthy, right? And, and everybody listening to this probably has an uncle, a grandfather, a grandmother, somebody that, that broke some serious health rules and they lived to like 96, right? And they didn't lose, so, this is where it gets confusing, interesting, and we, it's hard to really parse any of this stuff out and be confident in, in what contributes to what. What I'm comfortable saying is that the gratitude piece, the connection piece, and people talk about community, right? Like in the Blue Zones, they talk about community. I think that's a little off, but it's actually not community because right now we have a lot of community. We, what we're lacking is connection. Connection is the glue that holds community together. And that is the inherent quality that makes community so important, so valuable. So it's not this sort of elusive community, right? Because in fact, you can be a part of a community and feel totally alone, totally isolated. And that may actually be more harmful than not being a part of a community because when you're a part of it and you don't feel a part of it, now you feel like something's wrong with me. They don't like me, right? So it's really the connection. And I think the connection becomes really interesting because yes, connection with others, no question, right? Other people, but there's also connection with pets. And we know there's tons of research that has shown how much, you know, household pets, domestic pets, bringing horses into hospitals. There's tons of data on this and it it lifts people's mood and improves their health outcomes across the board in every case. So a connection to a pet, Right, but then we have connection to nature, let's say. Like if you're more nature inclined, feeling one with the plants and the trees and the rivers and the mountains and the sky, like this can be so impactful for certain people. And I would argue that if everybody starts to do it, you're gonna feel it. But then there's connection to God or spirit, right? Or oneness or or the all, right? That's a different connection. And depending on your religious background or not, that might look something a little different. But then we have connection with ourselves, right? Which 
one could argue is the God within, um, but but it is inherent with who am I, right? So there's connection there. So there's connection all over the place. And so working those connection pieces, I think becomes insanely critical, like maybe the most important thing, right? So so there's there's big parts. And then the trauma piece, like without getting too deep into that world, the core level, the core need when it comes to trauma is safety, right? That's what we didn't feel whenever a traumatic thing happens, it's a lack of safety. So there's fundamental human needs, safety, connection, right? Those are primary. And then the sort of more personal development side of gratitude, um, bringing awareness to the present moment, right? These things really do start to play a, a huge role too. So to me, this is where we kind of flip the whole thing on, on its head. And I came into this world with like exercise and nutrition, right? So that was like my core thing. And then I started going, wow, there's so much variability there and it's nuanced and it may change over one's life and it depends on what how sick or healthy they are. And my gosh, it's so, so interesting. Which just doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it because it is it is a critical aspect to our our interaction with the environment, right? Is is fundamental. Um, but yeah, these other pieces start to look very differently when you speak to these people and, and, and the religious component, right? Like, and I, I didn't grow up in a religious household, but ev- almost everybody I talked to, they had a really strong connection with God, right? Or, or, or Christ or, or some version of, of what God represents. And, um, and for, for in Okinawa, they, they're more Shinto is the kind of thing, which is not really a religion. It's more of a spiritual kind of thing connecting to ancestors. But nevertheless, there's some kind of connection with something that's not here on this planet that's a little bit bigger than oneself. And that was a, a primary factor in, in the way that they felt about uh, health and aging and longevity and dying and all that. Beautiful. And I think this this idea of connection is really profound. And like you say, we are more, there's more community and more groups and more social media than ever before, but it's actually that real connection. But I'm glad that you got to the self-connection and the connection to a higher power as well, because those two things exist without needing anybody else. And um, Laurentine's grandmother actually towards those latter years, maybe the last 10 to 15, she spent a lot of time in solitude, but she didn't lose a sense of gratitude and happiness and connection. Right. It was still there, it was strong, you know, so yeah. um, love hearing that and uh, yeah, really beautiful. One, one question I have, I guess a little bit is taking us away from this sort of philosophical connection a little bit here, but more into data, like how do we measure longevity and there's two three really interesting inflection points things that have happened right so we started measuring longevity we're like wow look at us western developed humans we're doing great but actually we just stopped infant mortality right that was the big thing that happened so when we when we sort of got rid of infant mortality cleaned up our hygiene a little bit it meant that less babies died or less young children died so therefore our longevity stats increased but then many great doctors i've worked with say hey we're living longer but we're dying longer right? There's this concept that we're actually just once we're 50 or 60, we're just on this chronic illness sort of pathway and just sliding into the healthcare industry, the pharmaceutical industry and the processed food industry of which they love because they get this great customer that's sort of half dead, half alive for another 20 to 30 years. So then we start to look more deeply at longevity science now. And there's a few people in this space, you know, and telomeres seem to come up quite a bit. And I feel like that's a pretty good measure for aging. It seems to be a little bit of the gold standard and we need almost like a datum point um, like we have on a chart with like a, 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 a tidal point, which is like the lowest astronomical tide, right? Which everything references from. We need a datum point, which is seems to be telomeres. And if, and you know, they get shorter and shorter as we die, like a shoestring type vibe. Is that a good basis point for us and and do you find that these long people have they tested their telomeres they have like longer telomeres compared to people that are similar age in a more developed country can we cover this a bit yeah it's yeah it's really interesting because the the telomere measurement sort of aspect is well let me put it this way there is no consensus on how to measure biological age let's put it that way right because we have the sort of calendar age right that, that we or chronological age right which is the time since birth but there's actually no great way to measure biological age we can look at telomeres and that's fine it the data shows that it doesn't really give an estimation of of chronological age or of, of biological age better than chronological age 
Um, and so, and people are trying to to put together all these different things because the challenge with telomeres, and, and again, you, your point is very good that that, that they are that they, they do sort of gauge the age at a biological perspective. But we have an enzyme called telomerase, so we can actually upregulate this enzyme that helps rebuild the telomeres. But then we also have other aspects to the genes that uh, genetic damage beyond just telomeres being shortened. So there's all kinds of different damage aspects to the genetic uh, blueprint, so to speak, that will confer all kinds of metabolic chaos at the cellular level. But then when we look at cancer, um, it's actually not about telomeres. It's about mitochondrial health. So mitochondria are these little organelles inside our cells, and we might have 10 or 500 in a cell, depending on how metabolically active, right? Like the brain, the heart, the liver, these are very metabolically active organs. So they have a lot of mitochondria. So if your mitochondria start to go, now you're actually tipping more toward uh, cancer, right? Chronic fatigue, cancer, these type of things. And so that's going to determine age, perhaps better than a telomere, because your mitochondria are losing their function. And so the other part with the telomere aspect it, that becomes challenging is that usually when they measure telomeres, they're, they're measuring white blood cell. And so now we have to look at, okay, well, what are we measuring? Are we measuring the telomeres of your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidney? What vital organ that might fail are we actually measuring, right? And so they'll use the white blood cells as kind of this overall benchmark. But what I argue in the book is that aging as we think about it, when it comes to the damage component, is actually organ and tissue specific. Nobody dies because their entire system shuts down, right? Like all at the same time. It's something fails, right? And it's and it's usually um, perhaps related to the immune system, which is why white blood cells is an interesting one to, to measure because usually what takes us down is some sort of infection or, you know, the results of an infection that are a result of, again, sort of system-wide damage. And so, but again, people die of heart failure, right? And aneurysms and all kinds of different reasons why people why people keel over. And so, so this is what becomes interesting. I could have, let's say, I can imagine a scenario where I have a 70-year-old liver, a 60-year-old brain, a 90-year-old heart, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. biologically speaking, right? So, so this is where- But then there's going becomes, to be a mean reading right out of your blood potentially. So there's something totally. to be said to it. But like you said, it's true. If one organ's like, kicking out at 98 and then it, 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 it dies, then it's all over. Right. So, so, yeah. so I, I might average those out and it says, okay, my biological age is 80. My actual age is 82. Um, and then my, but my heart age is 97, mm. right? Like it's, it's, we're, we're reaching the upper limit. So, so that becomes the challenge. And then mm. the other act, aspect to aging is what are we actually talking about? You know, because the telomere sort of argument is falls into the sort of two categories of aging, right? One is uh, sort of categories of, of aging theories, let me put it that yes. way. One is the damage theories, and, and there's a handful of damage. One, you know, Some scientists argue that it's the mitochondria that, okay. are, that we should look at, right? And that sure. determines how much reactive oxygen species are there, how yeah. much energy production, and it's the, the, like free the radical damage to damage, mitochondria. Right. Yeah. right, and some people argue it's the damage to the genetic code, right? So it's yes. the, the, the human genome that is really the thing that we should look at. Some argue it's actually the cell membranes. Um, and so it's membrane damage and we should look at that. And that's the, the, the key to aging. And so the thing about all these different theories is that they're coming from people who are trying to solve the aging problem. And that's the first hint is that we're categorizing aging as a problem, right? As this, this, this grand thing that we're trying to solve for. And I would argue sort of philosophically, spiritually, and I think the evidence has my back here, none of us are getting out alive, right? Like, I don't know anybody yet, right? I don't know any mammals or anything that, that has gotten out alive. In other words, we all die. And there's a, there's a, seems to be a natural progression of life. And so I think, and I, I say that bluntly because I think that the sooner we come to terms with that idea, <laughs> the better we are at, at living, right? And so we're tr if we're trying to escape death, that doesn't seem to be a very good reason to try to dig into this, this kind of thing. But if we're looking at it as a way to resolve um, some chronic disease, dysfunctions, ailments, and to restore health, then it becomes a worthwhile discussion to have. But beyond the damage theories, and there's a handful of them, the other theories are center around more of a programmed theory. And to me, this is where the evidence actually lies, is that aging or lifespan is programmed somehow into our biology. 
And I'm not arguing that we know where that is. There's a couple uh, indications that, that uh, this scientist, I think out of Japan, Yamanaka, um, has, has determined certain gen genes that are responsible for methylation and turning on various things in the body. And, and they're working with, you know, pretty simplistic organisms and m manipulating these things to figure out if they can extend lifespan and they have been able to, but so far it hasn't translated to humans yet. So we're not quite there, but I say that it's interesting to, to focus on program theories, because if you think about an, an elephant, it has a, an expected lifespan in the wild right? And, and it's, let's say an average lifespan, but then there's a maximal lifespan that, that people have tried to estimate or calculate, right? And then what's interesting is we bring some of these animals into captivity and they can actually let live longer, which is really interesting, right? So, wow, so now wow. We can I'm surprised that the domestication actually results potentially in some longevity. It can, <laughs> it can. But that goes it against be, what I would typically think, but this is one, well, animal, it, one, one animal, right? So we don't know. Yeah. yeah. Except for except for the fact that remember in the wild there's predators, right? So as soon as an sure. animal starts to get weak, they're done, right? Yep. So that tends to be what happens. And then there's some that, that are at the top of the food chain that don't have predators. And and I'm not sure which animals live longer in captivity versus others. I can't remember, but mm -hmm. but that is certainly the case. And and one can go research that very easily. So my point to this is is that it's interesting that each species seems to have a set lifespan. So that seems to argue for some kind of program in that species, in that animal, in that mammal, in that insect that tends to have, and of course there's variation, no question, but, but it's, it's, it's framing us into this model that I don't think we're going to solve aging as a, as a disease and, and live forever, nor do I think we'd want to, but I also don't think we're going to extend it to 400 years. Right. And so, so I think there's these wild ideas out there that, that science is getting so good that we're going to solve the aging problem. But, it's very, very complicated. Like everything is working together. Like for example, your, your, um, your thymus gland, you know, when your thymus, the peak function of your thymus gland is no, it's about 33. 13 years old. Oh, no, 13. It's, 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 oh it's puberty. God. Yeah. So this is, what's interesting is you look at certain mm. hormones, they fluctuate at di yes. different points in your life. Yeah. So the, 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 the programmed theories sort of argue for, um, this idea that our development as a human is yes. tied to our aging. Absolutely. So you can't separate the two. Right? Yeah. And, and so we like go an through periods. vibe, right? Like the iPhone. <laughs> and, and there's different things happening at different times, right? This is what, yeah. be, this, I mean, to me, this points to the magic that is life. Like this is mm. inspiring stuff that there's, mm. I mean, it's, it's wild. Why is it that we all go through the exact same progression of development yeah. at yeah. almost exactly the same times? Yeah. And, and, there's these peak function in certain organs and, and uh, hormones spike at different times. And then they, they, they yeah. get low in other times. There's all this like fluctuation and variation that have to do with, with our lifespan. And the interesting thing, the reason I even bring up the thymus gland is that, um, there's a, there's a longevity researcher named Dr. Pierre Pauli, or he's kind of a melatonin researcher, but melatonin is very, Which is very interlinked. Big area melatonin cortisol slope and longevity and health oh my yeah. god that's a big rabbit yeah. hole too let's get to well, that at the end too yeah yeah and i talk about that at the end of my book too why melatonin may be one of the sort of solutions to to longer life because it is the horm the darkness hormone it's also the most uh uh it, it reduces uh reactive oxygen species oxidative okay. stress okay so it is wow. the biggest most powerful antioxidant that's the word i was looking for so most it's powerful like an antioxidant it's like a, I talk about it as like a nutrient. Sleep is a nutrient, and most people are not getting enough of this nutrient, right? So yeah, okay, cool. It, it is, and, and 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 it works as an antioxidant in three ways. It directly uh, quenches free radicals, so it directly mops them up, right? Neutralizes them. It also turns on anti-inflammatory sort of signaling, so it actually will turn on like things like superoxide dismutase. So it's an actually signaling molecule for this these other antioxidant enzymes to turn on, and it it turns off inflammation directly. So it turns down reactive oxygen species as a signal. It turns up the antioxidant molecules and it directly quenches free radicals. And those are the, actually the only three ways that an that a, that a, uh, antioxidant can work. And so it is the, it, it does all three and it is the most powerful. So it's, it's remarkable in that, in that right. And it, it also works outside the brain. It, it, there's evidence to suggest that it's being produced at the mitochondria level in every cell of the body. And it's not, hasn't been totally accepted, but that's evidence is showing that. And it's definitely used by mitochondria. There's more melatonin in your gut than there is uh, in your, in your pineal gland. 
uh, produced in your gut. So, so it's, it's really interesting. And, and the link between the pineal gland and melatonin and your thymus gland is really interesting. So Pierre Pauly, uh, like I said, studies melatonin. He noticed that when he switched the pineal gland of old mice and put it in young mice, their, th- their thymus gland grew back. Like the, the, the dysfunctional wow. uh, old thymus gland of the, of the old mice that received the young uh, uh, body um, host. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Then, then it, re- it regrew. So the pineal gland of the young mouse can regrow and, and create a more functioning thymus gland wow. by inserting it into the old mice and vice versa. When they took the old pineal gland, put it in the young mouse, the thymus gland uh, started to get dysfunctional very quickly. So this is my point is that everything is connected and, and we, I don't think that regenerative medicine is going to get to a point where we can start fixing everything all yeah, simultaneously. Yeah. We're going to be chasing our tail, in other yeah. words, as this sort of declination start continues to happen because it's happening everywhere all at once. Yes. And I don't know that there's a way to sort of reverse that unless you shut down the development of a human, which I don't think yeah. you really want to do. It, it's, right? it's really, so, yeah, it's really interesting, Jason. And to, to come into this again in this conversation here, it, it, like Udo, Udo Erasmus, a, a dear friend of mine, and I've interviewed him a few times, he talks about this idea that we – are after we have babies, that's it. The, biologically, the earth doesn't have need for us. You know, nature doesn't have need for us. So it's like, okay, you've had babies, they survive, they're old enough now to go hunt and do their own things. And so then the body is just like, okay, you're done. So basically we're fighting against this planned obsolescence in a way, which is really interesting. So instead of saying, trying to solve for that issue, why don't we optimize for quality through that cycle? I, f- I f- love it. It's such a beautiful you, decision, you know. You're so right on. You're so right on. And this is sort of like an evolutionary biology perspective, which is that, <clears throat> like, forget humans. If you take any animal and you say, okay, they have a maximum lifespan and a reproductive period. Yeah. So what you want is you actually want, after reproduction, you want that animal to die off. That then, therefore, they're transferring genes, right? And there's a transfer in that transferring of genes to a new generation. There's a it's a little bit of a, 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 of a sort of lottery, right? Like which genes get transferred from you know, mom and dad and all that. And so, um, there's a, there's a variation aspect that goes into the next generation, which is really good because we always have a changing environment. So, so that needs to shift and change. And this is where the sort of adaptation in the sort of evolutionary model comes from is this genetic adaptation being passed down as a niche or as an environment changes. And we need that. Right. And so that's an important thing. So with humans, same thing, we actually want genetic variation to be passed down and we want very, let's say strong genes, um, or, or fit genes for that environment to be, to be passed on and sort of rewarded, so to speak. Right. And so if we try to continue to preserve life after childbearing years, or even in childbearing years, then we kind of disrupt that whole process. And so it's, it's the most effective way to ensure the survival of a species is to have this sort of recycling model where the genes get passed down, they get adapted, they get optimized. And what's interesting is that's what we find in the blue zone work. In Sardinia in particular, it's an island, right? And and in that island over the course of the last thousand years or more, there was a lot of invasions, but there weren't a lot of uh, conquering uh, peoples that came in. And so they actually held their territory really well just due to the circumstances. So in other words, the genes that are there are actually well-preserved. So why do we care about that? That means that the genes there in Sardinia, in the mountains in particular, those people have lived there for a really long time. That means their, their genes have slowly adapted, their human genes, as well as their microbiota genes, as well as their mitochondria genes. There's three genetic uh, networks inside a human that are all working together to adapt to an environment. Those are all become highly adapted to this unique and very specific environment. And what's interesting is we look at the populations now, and this is a little bit of the dark side of what we're talking about, but you know, the, the weaker or more unfortunate people in, that, in those regions that didn't have emergency care like we have today, they died off. They died young, right? They didn't make it. And so what, the people that survived were really well fit for that environment. They, they, they exhibited really positive um, lifestyle habits um, and they operated in their environment in a very aligned and conducive way. Therefore, their genes and the, everything that they were doing, the foods they were eating, they're all hyper-specific to that environment. So when we, we look at now, I'm, my heritage is you know 
for all over Europe, right? Like uh, my mom's mitochondria is from one place and that lineage is different. And, and now I live in San Diego. Like I'm total mismatch environmentally and I eat food from all around the planet. Uh, totally, because you're so, in America and they ship it from everywhere. However, dude, somewhere along the line, our ancestors survived the Black Plague. So we were strong right. to get through, right. right? So there's this whole lineage of just like, yeah, we made it, we made it, we made it. We're the, just the lucky few hanging out here. But then what you're saying is regenerative medicine could be saving people that have weaker genetic material and then keeping that in the pool longer. Look, it's that's, that's an what existential sort of and really difficult moral question to to talk about. But it's pretty yes. interesting, you know? Yes, that, it's exactly right. And that's arguably what we've been doing, right? I mean, I, I'm no big fan of, of big pharma and the medical industry. And yet, the medical industry have saved millions and millions of lives. Antibiotics alone, unbelievably helpful, right, for humanity. And so um, the surgeries and as, as many as much as we can pick apart the industry, and I, we don't need to do that here because I'm sure everybody is quite familiar. It has saved so many lives, and so people that in that otherwise without that medical model would have died are now here, and that's a beautiful thing. And so we can, should continue to save as many people as possible. And as weak as their genes are, so to speak, or as unhealthy as they might be, they, it is important that they're here and we need to keep saving people as much as possible. And you're right. It does point to this interesting moral question that we kind of pass on this weakness to. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that that can't be recouped. That's what's interesting, right? And so like, let's say my family, due to all kinds of uh, reasons, passed on fairly weak mitochondrial genes to me and, you know, a bunch of issues. And that's really where it probably mostly stems from is the passing on of sort of weak mitochondrial genes. Um, and so let's just say I start off there and now I'm doing all the things that are wrong for my health. Now I'm likely to develop chronic issues very early in life, right? And so that all that's pointing me to is a hypersensitivity to being super aligned with health principles. Right, and so that's what becomes interesting. Just like the mouse model, and this is a little bit of a, a veer on topic, but it's important to point out the mouse model on trauma. You know, they they, they took a, a mouse and they they gave it the scent of cherry blossom, and they they electrocuted it. Right, gave it a small electrocution, and that spikes the nervous system. Right, ne fear and, and huge uh, stress response. So they they conditioned that mouse to every time smell cherry blossom, they got shocked. So over the life of that mouse, that's what they experienced. That mouse was then paired with another mouse that did not receive any shocks. They had pups. The pups, then they smelt cherry blossom. Their nervous system spiked. No way. The pups had never been electrocuted. This is generational so that, trauma. Oh my God. That's right. That is such a but powerful piece of study. But it makes so much sense. Oh. It's important, right? It makes so much sense because what mm. a beautiful thing that nature passes on is, is information yeah. about survival. Hey, yeah. if you smell this, be on, be on alert. Yes. So I don't, we don't know how that's passed on probably through certain methylation patterns in the genes, but it could yeah. be in, in a variety of other ways. Wow. But what's interesting is that mouse, that, that first pup, first generation that had never experienced any, any trauma, they, that mouse got paired with an, another mouse that never experienced any trauma Yeah. and, and, and didn't have any nervous system spikes when, with cherry blossom. So completely fresh mouse. So they had a pup second generation that pup still showed nervous system spike. So that's two generations removed wow. and only one parent in each generation. So wow. my point to this is that, that all the, this information is passed through the genes mm -hmm. and this is what's really important. And that makes us really hypersensitive to certain things. And so mm -hmm. if our parents had a life that was tough, let's say um, Holocaust survivors, yeah. let's say they were uh, poisoned with Agent Orange, like well, you name hunger, it, there's a number of things. In, in Europe, you know, yeah. Exactly. Starvation. Then those things, if significant enough, will be passed on as sensitivities, so to speak. Mm. And that makes us more sensitive to certain EMF, let's say sensitivity, hypersensitivity to EMF or chemicals or, or certain foods that are difficult to digest. And that gets us into sort of food proteins and wheat and bread and all that kind of stuff, right? So this is where it starts to create a better, better model for us to view why we're so sick. And what's interesting is that if I live from alignment and I follow health principles, and when I say health principles, there are universal health principles and there are individual health principles for me that are unique to me. And if I can, if I can live by those to the best of my ability, I can actually recover health. 
to a large degree and start to pass on sort of, let's say, stronger genes or stronger heritage. And if that, if my son now lives by health principles from a really early age, now we're strengthening the genetic code, so to speak. We're strengthening the organisms through the lineage because we're living in alignment with health principles on a, on a sort of universal level, on an individual level, and in my environment. So, right, so that's, the, that's the upside is that, yeah, sure, we may have screwed things up for a few generations, but we can recover this thing. Great. I love it. There's optimism here. So let's speak about what are the key ways that we can optimize for longevity. If someone's in their 70s and they're like, damn, I just had a 7-0. I've got friends that have passed away and, and my parents passed away in their 80s. Jeez, i, I got to maximize here. And then if there's people in their 40s and 50s that are starting to think, you know, I've had children or, you know, and then that's behind me. And I'm obsolete now. <laughs> so, how, how do we how do how do we stack the deck in our favor, um, so to speak? Yeah. Like, what are the top sort of takeaways that you could share with people? I think, despite age, I think that the, one of the most profound things that one can focus on is their reason for living. Right? If you don't have a reason for living, there's a subconscious program running in the background that says, "I kind of want to die." right? And so your cells are going to respond to that. And again, that may be subconscious. It may not be a conscious thought, but if, you're, if your subconscious is living in that sort of energy, then your behaviors, your thoughts, your emotions are all going to skew toward, eh, kind of want to get out of here, right? And so whereas there's certain people that I admire and I look up to and I, I try to learn from that have an amazing passion for life, it doesn't matter how successful they are. They just love living. And I, I, I talked to a lot of those people and it didn't matter their age, right? And, and it doesn't matter their circumstances, which is wild to me because honestly, if I, I wish I could say something different, but a lot of my sort of happiness and contentment is still based on my circumstances. And, and I know that because I was recently in the Himalayas uh, filming a, my next docuseries and was working with some Buddhist and bone healers up there at like 14,000 feet. And it was so cold and there's no heat and we, we we stayed in this cabin with like holes through the the wall and i was literally freezing and 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 it wasn't until the sun went above the peak uh in like at like 9 a.m or 10 a.m where it finally started to feel like reasonable and i was complaining i was i mean i was a little <laughs> I, it was Fair i wish enough. i i wish i it, it showed me my mental toughness it mm. really showed me mm. honestly how comfortable my life is and yes. how much i depend on that so and you needed again, a little I bit of hormesis could, right like a little bit of like yeah, you know, yeah. the system. <laughs> and i could take that i like yeah. cold baths but then i get out and i warm up yeah, and i hop yeah, in my sauna yeah, and i do your, my you know, yeah put your like yeah. sheepskin like boots on and like a, you know, exactly walk yeah. around having a but cup there, of coffee with like chaga in it or something you know you know i was eating crap food there was nowhere to hide yeah it was miserable and i was there to do a job nice. and and yeah. and so that's the thing right so so it doesn't matter really if you can what your circumstances are um Ooh, yeah you big. can still find a joy for life and a reason for living and so this right. is where i think the idea of purpose starts to get a little skewed and a little wonky because in our western minds we think purpose has to do with either making money or yeah. being successful or accomplishing some huge mission it's 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 generally accomplishment based yeah. right um and and i think a reason for living is is more uh oh, indicative of, so of what beautiful. translates to health and in french they have right? a beautiful word for it. it's called raison d'etre which is like what's my reason uh, for being my reason for existing as opposed really? as opposed to like what I'm living to achieve some outcome, you know, and I think Patanjali, you know, the, the, the father of yoga or the yoga sutras speaks to this perfect, perfectly. It's like be attached to your dharmic purpose and your action or right action, vinyasa krama, but don't be attached to the fruits of your labor or the outcome of your labor, totally. you know, and this is totally. such a big term. We just then have not really grasped at a deep level in the developed West, because we're like, do action, expect result, don't get result, disappointment, pissed off, failure, as opposed to this sort of like full old school vibe of just chop wood, carry wood, let's go. This is my reason for being, I'm executing. If things are great, great. If things are average, great. If things are shit, great. You know, I'm executing on my purpose. And yep. such a big lesson. And I think we all get forced to learn it at some level. And you're just saying, jump the queue, learn it now, have a reason for being, execute on it, and don't worry about the circumstances. When I work with clients that are that are of ill health, they're suffering from something, it is the number one thing that I ask them. What is your dream? 
And it's a big question sometimes. And, so, and, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't need to be your, your biggest dream that you could ever dream. It can, it can be a smaller dream. It can be, I, I just want to be able to move well enough to play with my grandkid or whatever the case is. But there needs to be a, 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 a goal, an objective, not accomplishment-based necessarily, but something, a reason for living. There needs to be an eye on the prize because with that, then you will overcome the hurdles. You will do the things necessary to get your health back into order. And you will also be saying to yourself, I'm here for a reason. There's a reason I want to wake up tomorrow, right? In fact, I asked that to a 94-year-old ga- gal. And um, I said, you know, look, you're, I'm sorry to say your friends have mostly passed away. Even a lot of your family, your younger family has passed away. What keeps you up? What, what, what wakes you up every day, you know? And she said, well, I have to learn this song for the violin class on Thursday. And I was like, what an amazingly brilliant and, and so wise answer that was. There was no other big reason. She, she learned to play the violin at 92. So she'd been playing for two years and she was really horrible. I used to play the violin. She was terrible. And yet I was, I was so inspired by her because this is, I mean, I hope that when I turn 92, I have the, the will and the, the excitement to, to pick up a, n- a new skill like that. That's insane to me. Like so wild. And yet that was important for her to wake up and practice her violin and read her scripture and do her things. Right. So that was a, a, an exact uh, replica that I heard from other people in a variety of different ways, but it, it, it can be small, but there needs to be an, an impetus to keep going, to wake up, to live. And, and I think when you start there, then you can set the next sort of thing that's important, which, which is your intention. What, you know, you really find your intention. So, and they may be related or they may, may be separate, but what is the intention um, that you have for healing, right? So if you're, if you're not in good health or you're not, then what, what do you really, really want? Like that is mm-hmm. uh, an important thing to focus on. So if you, like if you what's start the why there, behind your, in- yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Nice. Yep. Exactly. So, th- so those are probably the two most important. And then in, you know, in the book, I, I literally go through a, a ton of different yep. um, aspects to living well. And, and they range, you know, a lot of them are the typical topics that you might think of, you know, it's exercise, it's, it's diet. Yep. Um, but there's also other things like circadian rhythm, mm-hmm. right? And this is chronobiology, which in 2017, so let's, the Nobel let's Prize just focus on that for the last discussion point now. So the first one was having a purpose, a, a raison d'etre, reason for existing. Second one was what's your intention for either healing um, or becoming more well, like which could be a why, like for my grandkids to be there to pick them up or for what? what's another couple of examples of intention. And then the third thing we're going to speak about is circadian rhythm, uh, melatonin, cortisol, et cetera. But when you say intention, like what type of intention um, uh, are you talking about here? Like what, what's some examples that you could give people? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if, again, if it's somebody's, you know, sick or suffering in some way, um, oftentimes what they come in with is a very loose intention, which is to get better, right? Or to not suffer. And that that's an okay intention, no question. But, but the next question is, well, why? Why do you want to get better? What is the reason, right? And so, so then it's sort of that it's sort of that next level that becomes important, and that might be to travel the world, right? Because they, they that's something they can't do because they have this serious gastrointestinal issue that you know they can't go more than an hour without visiting the toilet and you know all hell breaking loose. So there there are very simple things like that. Um, it may be um, to to go see my grandfather that usually it's some kind of interpersonal reason um to I, i'm i'm a young woman and i'm reaching my sort of later years and i want to have a child right like th- there may be a, a big why and so it's really identifying with what that is it may be that that you have such severe joint pain that you can't go play golf and you really want to play golf because it's something you really love so that's the thing when it comes to intention if it's preventing you from doing something you really love then that's a big problem because that's something you love is perhaps one of the reasons you want to wake up every day. So that becomes the depressive cycle that people can get in with chronic illness is it's, it's preventing them from doing the things that they love, you know, and that's, and it may just be even simply going out to dinner with their, with their wife or their husband and not having to worry about what they're eating. Right. I mean, it, it, maybe they're foodies or whatever the case is. Right. So there's so many aspects to life. And if we're, we're constrained, 
and we can't live the life that we truly want to live and be free in that way. Um, or maybe it's that you're, you're a coach um, and you're teaching people how to make money, but because of your you know, uh, anxiety or your depression or your lack of sleep, it's preventing you from reaching as many people as you can. Right? There's so many sort of intentions. And so the intention is to, to heal because this yes. or that. Right. Nice. Like that's, that's really, really important. That. And, and again, it usually has to tie into the, the bigger dream or mm. the, the reason for being right. Okay. But, but not necessarily directly. Got it. Perfect. Um, so purpose, intention. And the third thing is circadian rhythm. Let's talk about that. Yeah. And I'm glad you, you picked that one because it's, it's sort of an under discussed, um, and maybe some people have heard of it and they just don't think it's really that important. But this idea of circadian rhythm is so critical. As I mentioned it, the 2017 Nobel prize was given out to three scientists studying chronobiology, right? And so what that term means is, is the time aspect of our biology. And so that means our, our biology is, is, is working on uh, it's synchronized or it should be synchronized with the sun. So it's, it's on a daily cycle and there's other cycles in the, in the body as well, but this is kind of the primary one when it comes to the time aspect aspect to the way our body functions. And we all know this, right? If you've ever traveled, uh, if you've flown across time zones and you suffered from jet lag, that's, that's chronobiology right in your face, right? That means that your body's on one time zone. You just skipped ahead to a new time zone and your body's like, Whoa, hold on. Like it's supposed to be 5. AM and now it's like 6 PM what the heck, right? So, and cortisol and melatonin are probably the two big hormones that we look at when it comes to the rhythmic nature of our biology. In other words, at night, you know, melatonin starts to peak and then it comes down early in the morning, cortisol starts to rise. It's one of the things that wakes us up. But that is just scratching the absolute surface of what chronobiology is. We actually have genes inside every cell of our body, every cell called clock genes, right? So there's period genes. There's there's all these different genes that are related to timing of, of switching on certain genes and switching off other genes, methylating and, and acetylation and all these things. So it's it's kind of the the thing that's in front that that starts to turn on and turn off and, and regulate gene function. And it's the primary sort of uh, indicating factor of when to turn things on and off is that sort of time switch, right? And that's, it's primarily guided by the light entering our eyes. So when light, particularly sunlight, because it's so much more powerful than indoor light, that sunlight is entering our eyes in the morning and it's why our eyelids are so thin. So I, I, the sun actually penetrates through our eyelids and it can actually wake us up, right? So it, it hits the back of our, our eyes, um, sends a signal through the optic chiasm. Um, there's a, a super chiasmatic nucleus that is sort of this nerve center up here that then communicates to our hypothalamus and our pituitary. And this is where a lot of the, the hormone stuff starts to trigger, right? And then that communicates throughout the body. It talks to our pineal gland. So it's kind of this central highway that turns light into an electrical signal that starts to tell the body what time of day it is. And to some degree on our skin, um, you know, there's certain um, things like uh, certain cortisol switches that get turned on and other things. Um, but, but that is a primary indication. And then as the sun starts to set, right? What happens is that some of those um, frequencies of sunlight, right? The blue, the green, the, the purple, the UV, that's why you can't get a sunburn yeah. at, at, at sundown, right? Like going through sun more of the possible. atmosphere, right? Yeah. That's right. So only the, the longer wavelengths come through and everything else bounces back off into space. They get yeah. reflected, right? Which is why it's so cool when you see a sunset bouncing off clouds and it's green yeah. and purple and right. Maybe. So you're actually getting the reflected light that's now the hitting the clouds and, and reflecting off the water in the clouds, right? So so this is sort of the physics of, of how this is working, but those longer red and orange wavelengths that are now coming through, hitting the eye, hitting the skin, now the body's going, oh, okay, I know what time of day it is based on the frequencies of light and the strength of the light. So now I know, okay, turn off these things, turn on those things, start shutting this down. It's time for the body to start shutting down and going into cleanup mode, repair mode, regeneration mode, right? And that's what we call sleep. Now we can mess with that. And we, and people have done this to study circadian rhythm by putting people in like a dark hole, basically with no sunlight and, and see what happens to the, to the body circadian biology. And it just starts to go all wacky and wonky and awry. So it's, what happens is the sun is actually, it's synchronizing, it's, it's cueing um, our biology. It's keeping us on track. So it's, it's actually locking us in to a pattern. And, and to some degree, the darkness too, but the light is the most important sort of signal. 
And so if we have that consistent signal of daylight in our eyes in particular, now our body receives a strong signal of what time of day it is. Now, why is this important? Because not only at the genetic level, these genes turn on and those genes turn off, more functionally, it has to do with when is your digestion the strongest, right? When does your liver start to process this way and that way? When does your, you know, when does blood sugar um, um, sensitivity and insulin sensitivity become optimized, right? There's all these things. So, so now functionally, there's certain times of day that it's best to exercise intensely. There's certain times of day where your digestion is, is stronger than other times of the day, right? There's certain times of day when you're more alert and your brain is more capable of processing information. So this starts to guide our behavior, right? So if we know that our, our biology is optimized with the light, now it makes sense that I shouldn't be eating a pizza at 11.30 PM because no. my digestion is not very yeah. good yeah. and my body's trying to clean up, yeah. but I'm now feeding it a very energy intensive yeah. uh, meal of, of trying to digest pizza yeah. right, at a, at a really poor time of, of the night. Now, now I can do it and I've done it. I went to college and I yeah, did a no, lot of dumb most things kids did, yeah. and I survived, yeah. right? And so, um, but, but if we know those things, mm. if we understand that, then it helps us to um, recognize that our digestion is, is highest when the sun is highest, yeah. which is kind of makes sense. Our yeah. internal fire is synchronized with the solar fire. Yes. So now we can we can optimize that. It means our, our heaviest meal should be somewhere between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., yes. give or take, ideally. Yes. The most challenging foods to digest, like some of these like raw vegetables, which are mm. super healthy, better for midday mm. than it is for super late at night or first thing in the morning where our digestion just isn't quite as strong. Yes. Right? So and it needs waking up checks. at those times in the morning and we've got to wake totally. it up. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah. Absolutely. And so uh, so those are some of the things that, that, that are important when it comes to uh, the sort of circadian rhythm. But the other key factor is has to do with sleep, yeah. right? And so in order for a really nice high melatonin peak, yes. which is what we want, yes. we don't want this kind of weak melatonin curve. No, you want it to hit, um, we you want, want to get to, super tired and like crash out. Yeah. So, that's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. You shouldn't need to, to, to like go to bed at a certain time. You should be just like yeah. dozing off because it's getting you know late. And so- um, th the key factor to that is getting morning light. So it's really interesting that one of the keys to really good sleep is to getting morning daylight in your eyes. And I don't care if it's winter, if it's cloudy, if it's raining, it doesn't matter. Getting that daylight, even through clouds, your eyes will go, okay, we know what time of day it is. Spike the cortisol nice and high. That will get you energized, refreshed, feel good. Right? Cortisol is an important hormone for us to to, to get the day going, right? Low cortisol means we're dragging and we need coffee and we need all these, you know, donuts and other things to get us going. Whereas if we get some good circadian rhythm, we wake up, we don't need an alarm clock, I'm ready to go. And that daylight on a consistent basis will do that. It'll set our circadian rhythm. And then at night, we wanna avoid as much as we can any artificial lights that are particularly in the blue and green spectrum. And that's why you see people wearing the blue the blue blocking glasses, those orange glasses, and there's orange light bulbs. And now there's actually high quality, normal looking light bulbs that exclude blue and green frequencies that are helpful. But it, it also helps us to recognize that limiting screen time, right? Like sitting super close to a screen where the light is super intense, you know, at 11 p.m., that's going to disrupt my melatonin production. You know, we need that darkness. And so if we can abide by this circadian rhythm, now we're going to sleep better. That is the key, right? If people talk about sleep and how do we improve sleep and how many hours and blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, we all have different sleep needs depending on our age, right? Kids need younger sleep. Old people don't seem to sleep as much, right? That's part of the whole process of aging and, and where we're at on that curve. But then uh, beyond that, we're all unique. And so some people actually are kind of night owls. You know, they actually tend to stay up later. They need less sleep maybe. Um, you know, some people need more sleep. And this is something that's talked about in Ayurveda with the constitutions. You know, the certain constitutions, uh, a, a kapha person tends to get really good sleep. They sleep longer. You know, uh, a pitta person sleeps hard, but but doesn't need as much sleep. You know, a vata person is kind of erratic with their sleep. So Ayurveda has recognized this. Chinese me medicine has recognized this. And now we're starting to recognize this too, that we have different genes and different sleep needs and we're all different. However, you might think you're a night owl, but in fact, your circadian rhythm's off. So you actually don't know if you're an early bird, if you're a night owl, um, without setting your circadian rhythm. So once you do that, consistently getting up and getting that morning light first thing in your eyes, hopefully getting light throughout the day, which is something in the blue zones, that's all they did. They were outside all day. 
So their circadian rhythm is on point. Not a single person had sleep issues, except for the tour guide that I talked to who was like 34. And he's like, yeah, man, the only person that has trouble with me because I have this business. And, you know, he was like an American basically, um, but he's from Costa Rica. And so that becomes a really, really important factor because, you know, we talk about diet, right? And there's, there's really important factors to diet. And what I will say is that if your digestion is off, if you're not digesting, I don't care how good the food is. If you can't digest it, sorry, yeah. you're going to create inflammation. You're going to create all kinds of problems because you're eating a healthy diet and you're unable to digest. You're unable to digest it because you're eating too much or you're eating at the wrong time yes. of day or your circadian rhythm is poor. Or you don't have a strong fire like the Vedic tradition that's talks right. about, you know, like stoke your digestive fire in the morning, like turmeric, ginger, like that's going in, turning the fire on, certain breathing practices or like, I, look, just to recap a little bit what you're saying there how how you start your day impacts how you sleep i think is such a big distinction and breakthrough and i'm so glad that you brought that up because so few people are talking about it they're talking about nighttime rituals and you're like no how do you wake up so i think you know like barefoot sunlight let's go breath work cold exposure exercise something turn on the day let's go and it spikes your cortisol then at night you're like you actually just you actually just named a lot of the stuff that i have in my in my book by oh, the way great, it's, awesome. it's, it's a lot of those things because you can use breath work to start the engine yeah. right and the, and the sunlight's going to trigger certain things and going for a little bit of a walk right yes. like that starts the metabolic fire and all of that will set the stage for good breakfast digestion at 9 a.m or 10 a.m yes. or whenever you decide to eat yes. so people are talking about intermittent fasting yeah that's great yeah but why don't we talk about how to improve digestion yeah. with all these simple techniques so i love that you mentioned that. no so good and then like maybe a little bit of exercise or that in that morning time like simulated hunt you know like earn your food like it there's so totally. much to it and then like as you go through the day then naturally you've boosted the cortisol so at night the melatonin's coming up and you're like i'm tired i need to sleep so really big um uh, big breakthroughs and really if you think about that when you're sleeping or in parasympathetic it's rest digest repair like you said and that's when the healing takes place so if you think about how do I heal what I'm going through? It's set yourself up for great sleep. And it's a really amazing distinction. So to, to, to summarize the three points we spoke about, it's purpose, like what's your reason for being in a way, to intention, what's your intention for getting well or staying well? Not only it's almost separate from your purpose, but a little bit more around what's your why, you know, and yep. that's really beautiful. And then the third thing is this circadian rhythm um, sleep, yeah. melatonin, cortisol, slope. Amazing because stuff. it is important. Most important, yeah. most important part is sleep, yeah. right? Like if you want to live a long life, it's, it's how well do you sleep throughout your life? Oh, so good. That, yeah. It may be, I mean, that, that, that's where the healing takes place. Yeah. So we talk about all the things that are required to healing. We're into stem cells now and we got peptides and we got all this fancy stuff. But at the end of the day, if you're not sleeping well, then you're not going to repair very well. And, and the older we get, you know, look, I made a, I was able to just completely abuse my body, right, up until about 25. And I did, you know, and, and, and I could get away with it to some degree. And, and not to say I didn't pay the price, but it didn't affect me. As we get older, we can't make these same mistakes. We have less wiggle room, right? And so the sleep becomes a really, really critical part to that. And, and again, part of the sleep has to do with melatonin production and, and how we're clearing our brain um, through the glymphatic system, how well we're able to regenerate. So it's the quality of sleep we're getting. And again, that goes back to circadian rhythm. It goes back to trauma. It's all, it's all so interrelated. And again, it goes back to food. Are you eating at the wrong time of day? Because if you are, then the hormones that, that you want to turn on and turn off, they're going to get all skewed because you ate a meal at 9 p.m. And you're going to bed at, at 11.30 and you're watching Netflix. And that's that's disrupting things on a micro level. And you can get away with that when you're 25 and 35 and maybe 45. But as we get into our 50s and 60s and 70s, all these little things that we are doing now and we've been doing, they start to add up. And then we start to get into this metabolic chaos and we go, well, what's happening? You know, I, I, I never had a problem, right? So that's the thing about health is that, um, you know, it, it, disease sort of happens slowly and then quickly, right? And then it's just like, it's here. And it's like, oh, well, what happened, right? Well, the last 40 years happened. And so living in alignment is the best way to avoid those things. And so learning these sort of, this is a universal principle. You know, this is why the people that, that work night shifts, um, they suffer from all cause mortalities increase dramatically. Cancers, autoimmune conditions, digestive issues, anxiety, depression, you name it. It all goes up because the circadian yeah. rhythm is being sort of messed with in a huge, huge way on a regular basis. Yeah. And they think something's wrong and it's like, no, you're just out of whack. 
that's big. And then that's, and this is the challenge, right? And I, I hate to be so blunt about it, but I've worked with enough really sick people that I, I've learned that it, it, it takes it being blunt. Mm. You can't, you can't overcome those things. You can for a little bit, maybe, but over time it will catch up to you. Like, it's really important for me to sort of be honest about this when we're living out of alignment with the health principles of life itself, then it's just a matter of time before, you know, she hits the fan. And so if we can understand these things and look, if that's your job and you can't do it, then, then okay. You know, like, I'm not saying you, we all, you know, there's no, there's no judgment here about it, but I want to be honest about the fact that, that what's really happening there, because I see people living in moldy buildings and they try to do small remediation and think that that's going to be good enough. And it's like, no, no, sometimes you just need to move. I know how hard that is, right? And you're working this job and your health is suffering. At some point, you got to find another job. Like, I don't know what to tell you because it's going to be so hard to recover, right? So these are, these are really important principles. And if we can, uh, if we can accept them, if we can, we need to know that it is important yeah. for our health. Yeah. And, and there's another way because as we lose our health, our whole world starts to shrink. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it so many times mm -hmm. that then, you know, a sick person has one wish yeah. to be healthy, right? That's it. Healthy person has a million wishes, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the thing is it starts to close. Our world starts to close down. And I've been there. I've been there multiple times. Mm -hmm. And as we resolve those, those, those chronic conditions, the world opens up. And so it really is worth it. No matter what sacrifice, no matter how hard it becomes, um, stepping into these health principles and recovering your health um, is really the key to a long, happy life. And, and again, it, it really isn't about the, the total length. It's just a matter of how, how, how in the moment can I be? How, how much well-being can I experience day to day? And so if, we're, if something is preventing that, blocking, what is our natural state, by the way? Health is our natural state. It's not something that we have to achieve. It's not something that we have to go get. It's not something we have to earn. It is our natural state. It is who we are. And there's just things getting in the way. And so removing those obstacles allows health to flourish. And that becomes the key. I love it. Jason, you're a force for good. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today. I love that you've just focused on this for such a, a long period of time and you're bringing this all together in your latest work make sure to check out his book beyond longevity it's on hay house or go to amazon and while you're there add the food matters cookbook as well also with hay house that'll help you get in the kitchen and get it done as well because we know that is important uh and also check out his film. yeah they go well together yeah they, they go well together nice match. Match. Yeah. and yeah. the human longevity yeah. project is the name of the docuseries if you haven't checked that out so three things to check out and his spelling is jason prowl p-r-a-l-l -L. Peace, love, vegetables, and deep sleep, everybody. Great to connect. Uh, thanks so much, Jason, for your time today. It's been really great chatting. Uh, appreciate it. For everything that we've mentioned in today's episode, you can check out the show notes. There will be links and information there for you. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and be here for this podcast. If there's anybody that you can think of who could benefit from this information, please make sure to share it with them. We believe in the power of life-changing information, and it's especially powerful when it's shared from a trusted source. And finally, if you could leave us a comment or make sure to subscribe to the podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. It helps us continue to bring you this life-changing information and make sure that you get all future podcast updates sent to you. Have a beautiful day, and thank you once again.